This past weekend, thousands across the country took part in the March for Our Lives to bring attention to gun violence. While the catalyst for this movement is the recent school shooting in Parkland, Florida, the father of one of the victims wants to focus on what he says is the bigger issue. Here's Charlene Aaron. Andrew Pollock is on a mission to keep students in America's schools safe, something he wasn't able to do for his own daughter. 18-year-old Meadow Pollock was one of 17 people killed when a gunman opened fire at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. After being shot four times, Meadow still tried to protect another student. She covered the freshman, and this animal went down the hallway and shot my daughter another five times at point blank, and it went through her and killed the girl underneath her. During a televised listening session at the White House days after the shooting, Pollock spoke passionately about the need to protect schools. Should have been one school shooting, and we should have fixed it. And I'm pissed, because my daughter I'm not going to see again. Last weekend, students across America took to the streets, urging lawmakers to enact stricter gun laws. Pollock says while he's encouraged by this movement, he believes school security is more attainable at the moment. It's not a waste of time because they're, they're kids, they're making noise, they're bringing awareness to schools. So I applaud them for that. But I think if they focused on school safety first and then got all the schools safe in the country and then focused focused on gun control, that would be something uh, that's achievable right now. Pollock also told me his son was not allowed to speak during the March for Our Lives rally because his speech didn't focus on gun control. They denied him to speak with a couple of other boys too that had different uh, agendas. They, they wanted to talk mostly about school safety. Pollock also pushed for newly passed gun laws in Florida, which include raising the age to purchase a firearm from 18 to 21, a ban on the sale or possession of bump stocks, and funding for armed school resource officers. Meanwhile, Pollock plans to build a playground honoring Meadow and the 16 others who lost their lives in the tragic school shooting. This weekend, he's holding an event called Ride for Meadow. Motorcycle enthusiasts are encouraged to sign up to help raise money for the project. I had this idea to build this playground in, in the community in Coral Springs. It's going to be built. And everyone, everyone in the community is going to be able to enjoy it. And I'm going to build the memorial there for the other 16 victims. The playground, it can't be just a regular playground because it's for my daughter. So it has to be spectacular. I, I wouldn't settle for anything less. And that's the way she's been her whole life. She was never average. My kid was never average. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. In other news, French leaders are calling for Parisians to join them in a silent march today to protest the murder of a Holocaust survivor. 85-year-old Muriel Nall was stabbed to death in her apartment, which was then set on fire. Prosecutors have filed preliminary charges against two men of murder with anti-Semitic motives. During World War II, Nall escaped the rounding up of Parisian Jews fleeing to Portugal with her mother. She returned to France after the war. French President Emmanuel Macron tweeted, He's determined to fight against anti-Semitism. Coming up, 36 million Americans can now be identified as nuns. See why this woman and others with no religious affiliation are now going to church. Welcome back. Walmart is removing Cosmopolitan magazines from the shelves of their checkout lines. According to USA Today, the retail giant says the decision was primarily a business one, but concerns from the public about the magazine's sexual content were taken into consideration. The National Center on Sexual Exploitation, who helped initiate the change, said in the Facebook Live that now families won't have to worry about seeing degrading or offensive material while waiting in line. A Pennsylvania branch of Planned Parenthood received backlash yesterday after tweeting that Disney should create a princess who's had an abortion and is pro-choice. The organization has since deleted their tweet. The tweet received a response from the CEO and president of Concerned Women for America, Penny Nance, who said, quote, Planned Parenthood ruins everything and that Disney shouldn't listen to anything the nation's largest provider of abortion suggests. 
They're called nuns, but they're not Catholic sisters. These N-O-N-E-S are the growing number of Americans who don't identify with any religious group. The question is, how can they be reached? Heather Sells brings us the answer. Amanda grew up as a nun. She never went to church or spoke with anyone who did. My mom, you know, always told me that we don't talk to people who believe in God because, you know, they're weird or they're different. Craig, on the other hand, grew up going to church but took a stand in high school. At that point, I said, I'm done with, you know, church. I don't want to go. Um, I don't see any benefit. I don't see any reason why I should be going. Both Craig and Amanda represent a growing group. The Pew Research Center found that almost a quarter of U.S. adults say they either question God's existence or that their religion is nothing in particular. That's up significantly in just the last 10 years, with these nuns now representing 36 million Americans. Pew also found that a third of young people fall into this group, and high numbers live in the Northwest and Northeast. So why are so many Americans disconnecting from church? We came here to New England to find out and to learn what churches here are doing to bring them back. It's a new phenomenon that we're trying to understand. Dr. Sharon Ketchum at Gordon College outside of Boston and other experts are trying to figure out why a new generation is so anti-church. What we do know, these nuns don't believe in their faith anymore or the need for church. Craig says that's what he thought in his 20s. Really, it was, okay, you know, yes, I believe in you, God, but um, I'm going to do things my way. And as long as I'm a good person and as long as I do enough good deeds, you know, that, that will be enough. Others say they're unsure about so-called organized religion or just don't go. Church never crossed my mind as in something that I needed to do. Ketchum sees a bigger picture, a culture in which people as consumers judge church based on what it provides for their personal needs. We then have the amplification of me and Jesus and a reduction of the larger understanding of what the community of faith is about. Another part of the problem, says Ketchum, is simply the growing number of choices. There were days that we lived in where communities were given in our lives, but today community is voluntary. I can choose whatever church, whatever small group, whatever program meets my personal needs. And I think this may be one of the Pastor Chad Braswell is well aware of those who are disconnected, but says he's not discouraged. And so I just think that uh, when times get darker, lights shine brighter. And so it's, it's an interesting thing that we're seeing here because, yes, I see the numbers that you see, but I see this, this growing hunger after Christ. Many first-timers coming to his church tell Braswell their experiences of guilt or shame in previous churches overwhelmed any message of grace or hope. A lot of churches put so much focus on holiness rather than the hope that Jesus talks about. I think some people just feel they can't live up to that expectation and the guilt of uh, what they've done or what they are into. A focus on grace drew in Amanda her first time. A single mom remembers a coworker's invitation to an Easter service and how she cried throughout the sermon. I was so freaked out about the entire message and crying. I was embarrassed. I went out back and I got my daughter from Kids Church. And I'm like, we're never coming back here. And she's like, but mom, I met so many new friends. We have to come back. I love it here. Today, Amanda is involved in multiple ministries at Metro Church, as is Craig, whose wife brought him five years ago. At this point in my life, I couldn't imagine doing life without this community like without this group of people. That deep connection is key because research shows that people long for community and a bigger purpose than just themselves. There's no easy fix or formula for reaching those who have stepped away from church, but a church that loves its members and community is a great start. Reporting in Massachusetts, Heather Sells, CBN News. Still ahead, a new star is hopping on the scene in the White House. Meet the second bunny. See how the Pence's pet rabbit is actually helping to fight sex trafficking right after this.
As CBN News first reported, members of President Trump's cabinet meet weekly to study the Bible together and pray. EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt is one of 10 members of the cabinet who sponsor the Bible study. In a recent interview with CBN News, he says spending time in fellowship with other cabinet members working to live their faith is, quote, wonderful. Each of us are dealing with large issues. Yeah. And so to spend time with a friend, a colleague, a, fa a person who has a faith focus on how we do our job, uh, whether it's through prayer or through God's word, and to encourage one another in that regard is so, so important. Mm -hmm. and, and we have that in our, in our cabinet. Mm -hmm. And it's such, a, it's such a wonderful thing. Pruitt says the Bible encourages him to make the most of the leadership opportunity he's been given. The weekly cabinet Bible study is led by Ralph Drollinger, the founder and president of Capital Ministries. Well, look out, Vice President Pence. There's a new power broker on the scene, and his name is Marlon Bundo, the Pence family bunny. Amber Strong sat down with second lady Karen Pence and her daughter Charlotte to find out how their furry friend is helping raise money for a great cause. From the moment he hopped on the scene. This is Marlon Bundo. The second bunny, Marlon Bundo, has been a star on the rise. People kind of got a kick out of it that we had a bunny at all and that we brought a bunny to D.C. With 20,000 Instagram followers and a growing fan base, Marlon Bundo did what any celebrity would do. He wrote a book. Sort of. The vice president's daughter, Charlotte, is the author behind Marlon Bundo's A Day in the Life of the Vice President. And second lady Karen Pence did the illustrations. We thought, you know, it'd be really fun to do a children's book um, that also educated kids on the role of the vice presidency. But this isn't just a book about a bunny hopping around following the Veep. A portion of the sales goes to causes near and dear to the Pence women, like Riley Children's Hospital and Tracy's Kids. Tracy's Kids, I've been on the board there for many years, and... Uh, I first got involved when I found out there was something called art therapy, which uh, affected children with cancer so much so that they would ask their parents, when do I get to go back to the hospital? Mrs. Pence says she's seen this particular type of healing all over the world, from children to veterans. It's not arts and crafts. It's not like getting your paints out and feeling good after you paint. These are actually therapists who guide you through the art making process to actually bring some of the emotions and struggles and trauma that you're dealing with to the surface. The book also carries a deeper meaning for Charlotte. It supports A21, a nonprofit fighting against human trafficking. They have a lot of resources for people um, and resources for teachers to help teach people about the signs of human trafficking and how to notice it and recognize it so you can report it. And then they have information on how you can report it. Um, and through those efforts, they've rescued, um, I mean, tons of people who have been in these terrible situations and then they help them afterwards. Evangelist Christine Kane started A21 with the mission to abolish slavery everywhere. They're certainly spreading the word with operations in 12 different countries, including the U.S. This Marlon Bundle book isn't to be confused with others. Comedian John Oliver released a parody on the book at the same time as The Pences, as a criticism to the vice president's socially conservative stance. His book raises money for The Trevor Project, a charity dedicated to suicide prevention in LGBTQ youth. There are no hard feelings, though. Charlotte says she bought a copy of that book, too. Beyond raising money for charity, Mrs. Pence, an educator of 25 years, hopes the book teaches children about civics, too. Just like the vice president, Marlon Bundo's day begins here at the Naval Observatory. Then he heads over to Capitol Hill while the vice president presides over the Senate. The book is full of educational nuggets, and the Pence women say they planned it that way. At the back of the book, we listed several fun facts about the vice presidency or the Naval Observatory or other vice presidents. Marlon and the vice president end their day with scripture, an addition important to the second family. His faith is really central to his, his life, and we didn't think it would really be a fair thing to leave it out. It's just a part of who he is and who we are. Beyond teaching the children about the vice presidential duties, they hope this story helps educate people on the dangers of human trafficking and the power of healing through the arts. Amber Strong, CBN News at the Naval Observatory. 
It's great the Pence is using the talents that God has given them for a wonderful cause. We'll be right back. There's more of CBN Newswatch. Stay with us. Following Gordon Robertson's visit to Calvary Temple in India last year, the children's ministry has grown using CBN's Superbook curriculum in the church. Calvary Temple is India's fastest growing church. It was experiencing a huge need for innovative and engaging Sunday school material. CBN's Superbook team in India stepped in and trained the church's teachers on how to use the material. Now Superbook is being used to teach over 8,000 Indian children in five different church services. And you can find more of our exclusive coverage of the issues you care about most at cbnnews.com. Once again, thanks for watching. Have a great day.